formal mission of U equals me is stated as a movement of conscientious objectors to intolerance, or simply stated a movement against intolerance. And the exploration of that statement really gets to what, what are the similarities between people? What do we all have in common? Why are we really equal as humankind? And that's what we're going to explore. This podcast is about exploring conversational thoughts and interviews with extraordinary people living ordinary lives of well-being. Discussions on exactly what well-being means to people day to day, factors that can influence it both internally and externally. We glean insights on how to survive and thrive in feeling satisfied in life with a greater sense of purpose. Guest hosts bring fresh new outlooks and opinions from spirituality, science, worldviews, and standing up and speaking out for what's right. It's pretty interesting. Man needs each other and planet Earth to survive. Check it out. I think you'll like what you hear. Hello and welcome to our You Equals Me podcast. My name is Cindy Jarvis. I'm your host for today and I want to send love around the world to our friends and family everywhere. You know who you are and thank you for listening. I've been thinking lately a lot about compassion and empathy. And when I think about compassion, I think about Tina Webster, our guest this morning. She is one of the most compassionate people I've ever met. I'm excited uh, for you to meet Tina. I'm excited to share her powerful story with you of an exhilarating mind and fascinating life, a studying creativity, how she defines it, and how she achieves it. She's remarkable in all of her talents, which are endless. The author Walter Isaacson describes a genius, a marriage of science and creativity. And in his book, Leonardo da Vinci, Isaacson weaves a narrative that connects art and science to geniuses. And today we get to have a conversation with Tina, her studies in science, creativity and skills on how we can improve ourselves with passionate curiosity and careful observation. I love chatting with Tina and I know you will too. Welcome, Tina. Hello, Cindy, and hello to all of your listeners. I'm so honored to be part of this podcast. Wow, what an introduction. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for agreeing to this interview today. Um, Even with all of our technical difficulties we had this morning, I'm (laughs) I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I know that we've got a lot to get to today. So let's go ahead and just let's just dig in. Um, Your mother was an immigrant from the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. And I know that 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 was a very violent, violent time. Yes, that's right. And I actually um, have been studying Hungarian history. And it's just, it's a place that's at a crossroads geographically and ethnically. And uh, pick any point in time and go forward or backward. And you don't go far a day, a week, a month before you run into another conflict of brutal, you know, lots of violence and trying to, to choose the best side to take. To this day. To this very day. Wow. Yeah. So so your mom uh, left Hungary with, uh, I think, I don't know, th- hundreds and thousands of other Hungarians fleeing the revolution. Yes. Although she left all by herself as a teenager. Wow. What happened to her parents? Um. They lived in the countryside in east northeastern Hungary. Um, my grandfather had been conscripted into every invading army that happened to be passing through and was a very damaged person. And when I went back to Hungary with my mom, I didn't even know he was still alive. Wow. Um, my grandmother still, she died about a decade ago, but she lived in the hundreds of years old house out in the countryside in wine country. And um, where, although it wasn't as dangerous and as bloody as Budapest, you know, invading hordes of armies would come in and rape, pillage, and steal and plunder. And yeah, I know it was yeah, just awful. It's, it, it was. And so your mother came to the United States uh, all by herself as a teenager. Yes. Uh, so where did she land? I mean, she landed on Ellis Island. Mm-hmm. All she had were the clothes on her back and the purse. Wow. 
Oh my and she God. lost her purse there. So then here she was with no language, no body, no purse, no wow. idea. <laughs> how, how did she, how did she, I, what did she do? I don't know how she got here. Mm-hmm. I don't know how she got from Ellis Island to Washington State, but she did. Mm-hmm. She never shared that with you. She she does not share those times, no. Yeah, I don't blame her. You know, they, they're dark. Yes. Um, so so this might explain I, I know that you that you were not very close to your mother, um, but she she was um abusive. That's right. Yes. So verbally and physically, I know from the stories that you've shared with me. Yes, that's right. It was it was extremely intense. Um, not a day went by without some violence between wow. us. Wow, that's amazing. So I guess I, I do know a little bit that you just decided to take yourself away from it. You just decided not to, I mean, even holidays and, and things like that, there were always um, <laughs> slapping and hitting and and demeaning um yeah demeaning things i mean just happening. to kind of sum it up for people who are listening to this um i never once in my life heard the words i love you from my parents i never oh. once was held or or comforted or hmm. or um supported in any way that i can think of you know there was no congratulations on a job well done and no encouragement nothing like that ever and and I know that you were also discouraged from seeking a higher education in a, in a career. Well, that's right. So, you know, this is a culture where female offspring are only a liability to be um, ridded of um, mm-hmm. with some advantage. Marry, marry somebody off into a family that has more money or better connections. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like like old country, <laughs> totally you know? old school, totally old yeah. world. And yeah. if anybody's ever read um, one of the best examples and, and a fantastic book is Willa Cather's My Antonia. Oh, when I read that book, I so related to not just Antonia herself, but her situation, and huh. yeah, the relation it describes the relationships between her parents. Um, they immigrated, they landed in the Midwest, and lived in a dugout sod house. But yeah, this is a fantastic. I would book. love to read that. And, yeah. Yes. What? And Willa Cather herself said she thinks it was the best thing she ever did in her life to write that book. Wow. Okay. We'll have to uh, put, the, put that in the show notes too. I'd love yeah. to read that. It's a great book. So, so you, you decided that you were going to seek your own path. Um, <laughs> well, right? What I and, really decided was that I was worthwhile as a being. Uh huh. I don't know how, how did you ever come to that? You just through through pain, I guess, and introspection and digging. Well, yes, through observing. So I turned to nature mm-hmm. really early because I love art. Mm-hmm. I love the miracle that's around us in nature all the time, and I watched. Birds tend their young. Mm-hmm. Possums tend their young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in, insects make these cocoons spiders guard their egg balls and i everywhere around me it was obvious that what was happening to me was a fluke uh-huh it was because something wasn't right and i was going to i determined to find what was right oh good for you i and i know i love the sacred geometry in nature yes it's very obvious um yes i i just love that so you decided to go into science studies. I did. I, and it was interesting how that happened. Um, as I grew up and as I made my own way, um, I thought to myself, okay, you get the first 18 years, but I get all the rest. Uh-huh. And so I, I did my best to not make trouble. I did my best to excel at things. And I also did my best to nurture, I'm going to feed my own soul and, and to observe and think about what talents I brought into this world. Mm -hmm. So you, you obviously then had to find a way to pay for your own education since you weren't supported. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So when I was a kid, you know, I knew I wanted to go to college. I knew I had to get out as soon as possible. I knew I had to be able to support myself and never turn back. Right. And 
I was farmed out, basically slaved out from as early as I can, or an early age as I can remember. But the money that I made was confiscated. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't able to start saving any money for school until I was out of high school. Wow. I got lucky. I got a job um, making chainsaws. So <laughs> it was pretty, <laughs> pretty well paid. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, only oh, in the Northwest, geez. right? So um, pretty well-paid job um, that didn't require, require any specialized um, skills. Wow. Uh, and I made good money doing that. I and I was did. able to pay for my college that way. Wow. And this was, you were in Oregon at the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, that's <laughs> funny. And then while I was in school, I worked um, jobs. I worked in you know, as research assistants and found really cheap places to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the room with the bare light bulb and ants in the sink. Uh, but, yeah. but I was in college and I was making it. But yeah, you did it. Was, yeah, you made it yes, happen. Absolutely. So, so you decided to go into science. I did. Um, when I was in high school, um, let me back up a little bit. So when I was in high school, there were, we took these aptitude tests and there were these really weird. Yeah, pencil in. Generalized. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also had a really kind, I guess he was a boyfriend. We were really close friends, skiing buddies and everything. And he was going into pharmacy. And that's kind of where his decision to go into pharmacy made me think about health sciences. Uh -huh. And a lot of my teachers, counselors, really, really pushed me to go into medicine. Mm -hmm. I thought about that, but I didn't want it. And I thought, if I don't want it, I won't be happy. Right. Um, I I need to choose something that feeds my soul that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I learned about laboratory science. And to me, science is is where the art mm -hmm. and the you know answers all the W's. Right. How, who, what, when, where, why, and how do we make this beautiful and elegant and it can serve people and and help them have healthier, more fulfilling lives. It can relieve anxiety. I mean, it just, it was like the answer to me. Yeah. I was so thrilled to find this field. That's wonderful. That's uh, Freddie, our son is actually um, gonna major in science and, and it is fascinating, you know, it's- Yeah, it it's is. only getting more fascinating oh, yeah. as time goes on. Yes. You know, we're all dealing with the pandemic and think about it, yeah. in 10 months, there's a vaccine that looks more than one vaccine that looks very promising. Right. So the people who did that are the scientists. Right. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, and the and the work that you did was clinical pathology. So this is exactly the type of work that that you did. You know, when you were talking about the pandemic, this is exactly the type of clinical pathology that you were working in. It's very similar. So I worked in a clinical pathology in a hospital laboratory for most of my career. That's that's where I made my salary. That's where I retired from. Mm -hmm. But I also um, worked in re on research projects um, while I was in college and while I was working in these clinical pathology laboratories. And um, uh, one of the one of my favorite, one of the most fulfilling research projects I worked in. Um, was with a team of two other doctors. Well, not two other doctors, two doctors. I was the medical technologist. Okay. And uh, we did research um, collecting patient information and produced data that led to the approval of an antimicrobial used to treat bacterial pneumonia. And uh, that drug or generations of that same product are still being used. And but to me, that's like, that's where you're really... Think Making a difference, yeah, um, yeah. You're curing somebody, helping somebody's body cure itself of pneumonia. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that that's my. It, I know, I know, I know. It's just <laughs> mind boggling. Um, but I do know that there was also, um, you know, sometimes I don't know if there were a lot of female scientists, you know, where you were, where you were. But um, I do, I do remember uh, you saying something about. A hostile work environment and and gender inequality that was pretty obvious. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like for most, frankly, right now, all women that I know that are my age, 
or older um, can say that. We've all dealt with it. Yeah. I have yet to meet a woman my age or older who hasn't hasn't been assaulted in some way. Yeah, true. And um, yes, in the setting usually was, especially when I first started out, um, it would be the medical technologists were largely female and the managers and the pathologists were largely male. Mm -hmm. And um, it was also a quasi-military environment being in a veterans administration setting. Uh -huh. And I could, I could tell you stories. Yeah. 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 <laughs> about you did. Not, just, not just verbal, but physical assault. People trying to um, wrench the lock of the bathroom door open while I was in there. Oh, jeez. Um, people coming up behind me while I'm sitting at the bench doing my work in a class three biological safety lab. Yeah coming up behind me and grabbing me, putting their hands on my breast, pressing up oh behind my God. me and telling me that they want me to have their babies and they're going to be waiting for me in the oh, parking that's lot. Just, I hope you turned around and punched them. Well, I didn't. What I did was I followed the rules. Right, right. right. You file, a, you file a, a report that goes nowhere mm -hmm. and then you're labeled as a problem employee. Oh, right. You don't get that's the promotion and you get watched closely and, you know, don't get the choice assignments. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> you don't get the vacation you asked for, um, and the report goes up the chain, and somebody up the chain sends it back down the chain and says fix it, and so it never went anywhere. Wow, that's and it incredible. wasn't until the, the employee I was just describing who who was um, grabbing me from behind. He finally, finally one day came into work with a gun, and they finally did something about it. Oh my! Him. Wow, that's uh, yeah, that's what it took to get. To yeah, that's, to get that's, out the of that. that's the reality. That's the reality. Yeah, I remember too. Another story I'd like to share. Yes, yeah. um, it's one of those. It's a me too moment. It's we're not alone. Mm -hmm. It's an, it's a we're not alone moment. It didn't happen to just you. Right. We need to talk about these and air these things. One of my last lectures in graduate school before I sat for my boards was to the entire class. There were a few guys in there, but they invited this well-seasoned pathologist to come in, a man, and lecture us on how to, how to interview for a job. So for 45 minutes, we listened to him tell the women how to wear a dress so that our cleavage showed. No. Yes. How to wear a skirt so that this much of our legs showed. How to wear high heels because it made our legs look better. Ugh. What kind of jewelry to wear, how to do our hair, how to sit. Yeah. That is unbelievable. And it just wasn't that long ago. Nope. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Wow. But it did happen. So that's... Yeah. To dress, dress sexy for your interview that, and you'll get the job. That's just crazy. Yeah. And the, and the instructor of the class was standing right there mm -hmm. and she did not do anything. Yeah. Boy. Finally, one of, one of um, my classmates, a more outspoken woman who had two parents, her, both her parents were teachers, it turns out, she stood up and told him off oh, and the rest of us stood up and clapped. Good for her. Standing ovation <laughs> yeah. for her. Yeah, she got a standing ovation yeah. from the class and he and that pathologist slunk out. Yeah. Wow, that's an amazing story. So so you've had you've had such an interesting life. I want to you're a <laughs> pilot as well. Yeah. So tell me about that. Well, I mean how did well, you ever do that? Well I was just born wanting to fly. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, I I through my childhood would watch nature. And I was always so fascinated with birds. And also I would daydream. I would daydream about being able to just levitate <laughs> and go where I wanted, you know? And, and I also had this really, I was really drawn to the mechanics of how a plane works. Uh -huh. it, it, this heavy metal object hangs in the air that yeah. we breathe. That's how does that happen? And so one day when I was in my forties, I just woke up and I decided today's the day I'm going to learn to fly. And I called, <laughs> I called somebody and said, I want to learn to fly. Can you teach me? And they said, sure, come on out. We'll go flying today. Wow. And I went up. So I had ridden large, you know, commercial jets a few times, not many. I'm not a big uh, long distance traveler, 
but this is different. Getting into a tiny oh, little trainer aircraft yeah. is a whole different thing. Basically, you put that plane on. Your your shoulder is either touching your instructor or it's touching the the side of the plane. One shoulder is touching one. One shoulder is touching yeah. the other. <laughs> You're just it's smaller than a VW Bug. Yeah, I've been in those little planes. They they are they are small. They're they're small yeah. and it's very real. You feel all the air. Anyway, so mm-hmm. we we went and I loved it. Yeah, good and for you. So I I ended up. Um, just loving it. And I also met a fabulous community of people. Mm-hmm. I really felt accepted and that I belonged and I felt respected for the work that I was putting into it. And um, it's quite an I'm, accomplishment, you know, I think. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And really? I'll tell you, the hardest thing I've ever done was to get my instrument rating, mm. which I did. But um, I got my private pilot license. I started my instrument training. Mm-hmm. And as luck would have it, as bad luck would have it, 9-11 happened. Mm. My instrument check ride was scheduled to happen basically a few days after 9-11. When 9-11 happened, the FAA shut down right. um, airspace and then kept it shut down for general aviation for a period of time. So here's the really odd twist. While I was waiting for general aviation airspace to open back up, my my medical certificate expired. What? So I need a medical certificate in order to fly. You need your, oh, your right. pilot's license mm-hmm. and your medical certificate needs to be current. So I went to a random flight surgeon, as one does. They send you these postcards in the mail around your birthday and say, come on in. And For, for your medical um, test? Yeah, you, you pay them in cash and they do the, your, um, your um, flight physical. Right. Well, 9-11 had just happened. I go to Lloyd Center. I go into this physician's office. And for the very first time in my life, and I don't really know, I suspect it had to do with 9-11 and caution, but maybe it didn't. Maybe it was just a random bit of good luck for me. But this physician gave me the first real physical I had ever had in my life that I oh, know of. Really? He actually did a hands-on physical examination. Mm-hmm. And years earlier, I had been complaining to my own physician about tachycardia, my heart racing at night mm. when I would lie down to go to sleep, or these you know waves of, of energy that I couldn't dissipate. I just felt like I was on adrenaline you know, when I didn't really want to be. Right. And I was, you know, in my 30s and it was that time. And so I kept getting these prescriptions for Prozac, which I never, I was like, I am not depressed. Right. <laughs> I have friends, I have things to do. I'm going places. Yeah, it seems like they depressed. just prescribed Prozac for every little. They just kept yeah. Me, yeah. You know, you're a girl that age, you hear it's your Prozac. Yeah. But that's how I felt about it. I don't know what they were thinking, mm-hmm. but I gave up because my problem wasn't getting fixed even when I complained to a physician. Mm-hmm. So flash forward back to this, this Flight man physical. gave me. Yeah, the flight physical. He gave me a true hands-on physical. He started at my feet, worked his way up. And when he got to my abdomen, he said, how long have you had this mass? And that was a life-changing mm. moment. Wow. Yeah. You're like, what mass? <laughs> <laughs> what mass? And because I was, I was thin, active, I felt great. Right. I did, but I couldn't stop being active was a thing, mm-hmm. which is why I was so thin. So the upshot of all that was he he finished the physical. He recommended that I go to um, a different doctor, and my medical certificate was denied by the FAA oh, as it should right, as it should right, have right right. Uh, so that was pretty stunning. Um, the upshot from all that was, um, of course, I was um, I went to an, a radiology suite where they were did some imaging, and in that episode, they found another a serendipitous find, which was a much worse mass deeper in my body. Mm. And that led to a, a very large surgery. Yes. Um, yeah. And then shortly after, I also ended up getting divorced and moving to Seattle. And um, I was able to transfer my work. Mm-hmm. And about a month into my new job in a new city with <laughs> not knowing anybody. <laughs> really, Tina? The the FAA was also still reacting to 9-11 and they had just they had just 
change the rules for shipping biological specimens and making the rule tightening the rules and making the containers more airtight okay so so you're back in the lab in seattle now okay now i'm in seattle in the lab right and um, i'm still recovering from my surgery but i'm back at work that must have been a long recovery i mean i because i know it was a major major surgery yes it was it was big so does that mean no pilot license well um they didn't take away my license they just didn't approve my medical. I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so here we are. We're in Seattle. In the lab. In the lab. Um, they, the FAA and IATA, I A T A, changed the rules for shipping biological specimens. So, and it all happened on one day. This day you ship it the way you used to. Tomorrow you ship it in this new way with these new containers. So, we, the new containers came. Nobody got trained on them. Uh, the fellow who was supposed to pack, you know, um, what he was packing was serum specimens from patients that had screened positive for HIV. And they were going to be, um, those positive screens were saved, frozen, and then uh, batched, sent in batches to a reference laboratory for confirmation testing. Which was your laboratory? No, no, our laboratory did the screening and we sent the confirmation out to uh, we had to send it by air uh, to another state. Okay. So this this coworker uh, was given these new containers to use, but not told how to use them. So because we're shipping them long distance over a long period of time, we pack the specimens with dry ice to maintain their integrity. So he put about 80 test tubes of HIV screen positive human serum in this high impact plastic receptacle with a screw top lid and he put the dry ice inside and he screwed the lid down and then the dry ice began to sublimate um, so go from a solid to a gas and that increased the pressure inside of this container which Whoa. started to swell up and it looked like a beach ball so it started out looking like a canister ended up looking like a beach ball he had it in his hands i was i didn't know what he was doing i i had no idea what was none of us had been trained or told what was going on and um, I don't know why he came to me, but he did. And he tapped me on the shoulder. When I turned around, he held it up to show it to me. And I immediately knew what was going to happen. But before I could even say, ditch it and tell people to leave, it blew up straight into my face. Ugh. And pieces of that, that plastic container went through two sheetrock walls. Wow. Um, so my face and my neck and shoulders were, were just in, embedded had glass shards and frozen oh, serum yeah. embedded in i couldn't my see. heart's pounding just hearing yeah. the story yeah i couldn't see my eyes were bleeding you know my eyelid and eyebrows were bleeding so badly i couldn't see so you were um, rushed to the hospital so they rushed me upstairs to emergency and they kept yeah they rushed me upstairs to emergency um thank goodness we had an excellent employee health nurse who heard me say what had happened and got me started on the um, HIV medication that was available at the time. Because there's a time limit. There was a time limit between the time you're exposed and the time you start taking the antiretroviral okay. medication at that time. There was like a two-hour limit. Well, the doctors in ER were so worried about my heart rate that they weren't hearing me talk about what had happened in the explosion. Right. And so then I got sent home for a while and I was really, really, really sick from the medication. I, I didn't tolerate it well, but I took it as long as I could. And um, that was, so that was and, and hard. What a, what a wonderful recovery. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. You learn a lot about yourself when, oh, when these geez. things happen. Jeez. That's just amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. You know, people's lives, you, you know, you and I always talk about this. You, yeah. You never you never really know who you're walking down the street with. You know? No, and you don't know what their state is. Their they might story. be trying to hang on to normal as best as they can. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we talk about this. You never know when somebody's just, you know. Right, the and that's where, the, that's where the compassion comes in. Yeah, I know that. And you have a, a story that you uh, sh- just shared with me recently about a, a student. Yeah. In your... Yeah. It, and it, it ties in. It ties into what you're just saying about you never know what the person around you is dealing with in the best way they can. Right. And, you know, to not judge. 
I think people, most people are trying to do their very best and we're not all dealt the same hand. Right. And we don't all have the same resources. But so this, this story, um, stays with me. There's so many stories from working in a hospital lab, but yeah. Um, back in my original VA position, uh, we taught medical technology students um, in the laboratory itself. So they would go to their rotations and then they would rotate into a hospital laboratory and get some actual experience in that topic that they were studying in the class. Mm-hmm. So we, we always had one or two medical technology students. And these are really bright people. Right. They're really um, curious and bright and hardworking yeah. and focused people. So we're used to that sort of personality coming through. We got one student, a young woman, who she was slow. She was quiet. She seemed very introverted, but she was steady. Mm-hmm. She would stay and get her work done without complaint, but she didn't work at the same faster pace that what people were used to. And people began to talk about her and make fun of her. Mm-hmm. They started avoiding her. You know, some coworkers started, they didn't want to train her because she just slowed them down too much. And she wasn't as responsive. She wasn't as fun. Right. And at the end of the day, when we'd be wrapping things up, there'd kind of a group of people would form and they would start, you know, talking about her and it just didn't feel right to me. Yeah. Um, and this young woman, she knew that people were talking about her. She knew she was too slow. Right. She just methodically kept coming back every day. One day she didn't come back. One day she didn't show up in the morning mm-hmm. and talk was, oh, you know, she's, she's there was, there was unpleasant talk happening about yeah, why she quit. Her. She can't handle it. Yeah. Or she's too lazy or right. she's still, she's so slow. She's still trying to get mm-hmm. here. All the perceptions that we put yeah, on the, mm-hmm. the judgments and let, you know, the really missing compassion this moment. Here we are in a hospital, missing mm-hmm. compassion. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so ironic. Well, we found out that same day that she had died in the night. And the whole time she had been coming to us, she was combating end stage lupus. Mm-hmm. And and she was I, just wanting to instead of live you know, instead a regular of, yeah she wanted a to regular contribute. end to her life or right instead of um just being doing doing many you know any one of a men, number of other things she wasn't complaining mm-hmm. she wasn't walling herself off she was work i think she was probably one of the hardest working people yeah. i ever knew yeah, to she, work right up to the hours before you die yep she just kept showing up for herself well, and it was, and it was definitely for me too, mm-hmm. <laughs> because whenever I feel um, a little worn down or a little like things are unfair, I think of her every time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you do, a, you do a lot to keep yourself centered. I know you're a builder. You built your own kayak. Um, yes. I, I talked when I talked to you the other day when I wanted to invite you on the podcast. You were fixing the siding on your house, and. Yes. And you've also done, you also had to jack up the foundation and repair the foundation because nobody else would touch it. (laughs) This is, oh, Tina. I I called my dad for help and Peter came out and helped too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was sort of like, oh my God, look at this. We could either do it ourselves or we could try and find somebody who would do it, but they wouldn't do as good a job as we would. So so I stood there and looked at it with my neighbor for a while. And I said, well, I think I'm going to go inside and call my dad. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And, you know, your dad, what? Talk about foundation. What a rock he has been for you. He has been. He has been. Like I said, the beginning was hard. Mm -hmm. Those early days were hard. And his beginnings were very hard, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did not get parental guidance from either his mother or his father. Um, just because of the time, cir- other circumstances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so <laughs> we've done a lot of healing. Yeah. 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 Well, he, and he's also in really good health and really good shape and currently living in Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. He keeps himself in really good shape. Um, he has some chronic conditions that, that help him decide to do that. But mm-hmm. also I think, I really believe that part of it is that he wants the time with me and my brothers to mm-hmm. make up for the time we didn't have earlier. 
Yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. I know that um, you're also in really good shape. You're you're a recreational athlete from skiing, cycling, this kayak that you built. Yeah. So I love, I love recreational sports. I love that connection to nature with with the earth and the elements. If you're windsurfing, you're getting all that. And I was lucky enough to live near the yes, mecca, the yes. world mecca for windsurfing, with the Hood, Hood River. River, and it's you, the water, and the wind, and, and your equipment. But you're the connection between the water mm-hmm. and the wind. You are the connection. And you get these, it's so exhilarating and beautiful and peaceful. Um, yeah. And there's a community uh-huh. out there. And that fills your cup. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same thing with the kayaking. It's not as, ex- I have a touring kayak, so it's not as, ex- it's not exhilarating in the uh-huh. same way. It's not an adrenaline rush, but it's beautiful. Yeah. There you are, absolutely peaceful. You're not disturbing nature very much mm-hmm. anyway. And you, you get to sometimes, when I'm kayaking out there where I like to in Scapoose mm-hmm. Bay, the water is so still that the water and the sky are one oh. scene and it feels like you're floating in, but you're suspended mm, in the that's air. That's a beautiful visual. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, gorgeous. Yeah. And you get to see the, you know, the waterfowl, the egrets and herons and turtles mm-hmm. and carp. And sometimes there's, it doesn't bother me. There's a little snake, you know, a little garter snake will swim across. <laughs> um, <laughs> the scariest thing when you're out there is you, you, it sounds like there's a Sasquatch coming after you, but it's really just a cow. A cow. Wow. <laughs> cow walking through the That's bushes. That's amazing. But yeah, it, it's really beautiful. Well, yeah. No wonder you're, you're so um, centered. I know that you're also a gardener with a greenhouse. So I know you love yeah. to dig in the dirt and a parrot mm-hmm. parent. Yes. That's, what's, yes. The, what's the name of your parrot? Her name is Max. Max. She's um, kind of an old gal, isn't she? Yeah, she's getting close to 30 oh, years old now. That's amazing. Um, so this is my most uh, exciting, well, not my most exciting, but you also play the banjo and the piano, and you play in a bluegrass <laughs> band, in a band yeah. called um, Three Play Ricochet. Uh, that's right. You taught yourself how to play the banjo? Well, I had great influences. Um, so I would say that, I mean, you have to do the work, you know, you, you can throw a lot of money at an instrument and lessons and true uh, going around from place to place, but you've still got to do the work. If you, if you're going to learn to play it, banjo is bluegrass banjo is, I would say very unforgiving Mm -hmm. as an instrument, but the rewards are there. All I can tell you and the listeners is that Every once in a while, we've all had this happen. So you might want to think about when it happened for you. I walked into this place. I never had seen a banjo before. I never had listened to bluegrass music except for, you know, the theme song to Beverly mm-hmm. Hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in Salem, Oregon, and I just happened to walk into a coffee shop, you know, back when you could yeah. do that. Yeah. And there, something was going on in there. I remember I stood stock still. I don't even think I closed my mouth. There were two men in there playing their instruments. One had a mandolin, the other one had a banjo, and they were sitting in two, each sitting in a chair facing each other playing, and I could see the sparks flying between them. I could see them making eye contact and sharing ideas musically okay. and te- like you know telling each other jokes musically. Okay. Wow. And the they were having more fun than I had ever seen anybody have, ever. That's wonderful. And besides that, I because right there's a mandolin there too. Something about that banjo yeah. got me. I wanted that. Wow, that's incredible. Well, yeah. and you got it too. You got it. You. Yeah, I worked at you it. Definitely yeah. did. Uh, Tina's band is called Three Play Ricochet. Uh, the website for that is www.3playricochet.com. And I know that you also help organize music camps, uh, bluegrass and old time music camps in, in Grass Valley, California, a banjo camp in uh, Port Orchard, Washington. That's cool. Those are, that's right. Yeah. Good for you. That's what we do in our retirement. And again, those things are about, those are community building uh-huh. events. Yeah. 
And, and what I really love about the music camps um, is that for a lot of people, they don't get the chance when they're a kid to go to right. camp. The, you know, maybe their families couldn't afford to buy instruments and teach and teach um, and have them learn, you know, take music lessons. Yeah. Um, but the total immersion and, in, into the music. Yeah. And so some people have to wait until they're retired before they have right. the time or they have to wait before they have the resources. Yeah. If you run one of these music camps, most of the attendees are older people. And so they're meeting like-minded mm -hmm. people. They're stimulating their, you know, their socializers. They're keeping their minds and their brains active by learning and by taking right. chances getting out there at the student concert, getting on stage yeah. and playing for the Pushing rest of the yourself. people. It's wonderful. It, it's yeah. It's so healing. It's so beautiful to see that you can yeah. probably tell right now. I get <laughs> No, <into> I love, <laughs> I love hearing the stories because uh, I know that you've spent a lot of time organizing and making sure that things run smoothly and that, you know, people yeah. have a really positive experience. So I will also put those uh, music camps in the show notes for anybody who's interested. That's Thank wonderful. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're quickly coming up on 45 minutes here. That's, uh, I could go on. It's just amazing. It's so fun talking to you. <laughs> and it's, you've just had an amazing life, Tina. Thank you so much for sharing. I know you're a huge supporter for the U Equals Me Foundation because you did the Women's March with us in 2016. Yes. What does the, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that was one of those, another one of those life-changing moments where I was out there in the streets of Seattle, surrounded by, by like-minded people I didn't know existed. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, thank you for supporting uh, U Equals Me and everything that it means to you. So uh, we, do know, we do know that only the development of compassion and understanding for others can bring us the tranquility and the happiness we all seek. You, you've you've done a great job of illustrating that, Tina, and how we can make our communication more compassionate and empathetic for a more rewarding uh, experience towards inner peace and understanding, even in our own close relationships. You're truly amazing. You know, anybody, it's your choice. Right, it is a choice. Your choice to choose compassion. It's your choice to accept people for who they are. And it's your choice to live your authentic life. <laughs> Beautiful. I yeah. love it. You know, guided by your talents, your passions, your own personal, you know, form of compassion. That's wonderful. I love it. Thank you for your time today, Tina, and everything you brought yeah. to this podcast. Uh, thank you, listeners, for listening today. I can't <laughs> wait to, to listen to the replay myself. Thank you, Tina, for your time. Oh, what a beautiful world we live in when we stop to take yes, a look. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody, until we meet again. Yes, yeah, which we will. Thank you. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed our broadcast today. If you have, please share with family and friends. For those who wish to support the U Equals Me Foundation, your tax-deductible purchases of U Equals Me logo wear can be found at uequalsme.org or our U Equals Me Etsy store, which is all one word in your Google search. For a complimentary copy of our ebook, Wisdom Along the Way, a book of notes and quotes, you can join our One Worlders group email list at uequalsme.org. Links will be in the show notes. Thank you. Much love around the world. Be safe. Be kind. Be you.